Well, I appreciate you guys coming out this early in the morning. They always give me the early talk. I think they do that on purpose. <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Lepresi. Like you said, I'm from St. Pete Design. Uh, we're a web development company. And uh, we basically, we're based out of St. Pete and we do um, custom software and accessibility. All right, what we do is we audit and remediate WordPress websites for accessibility issues. We teach um, corporations and IT teams how to be compliant and stay compliant. We give WordPress accessibility talks and we build custom software. All right, our story, a couple years ago, we got a job from a government agency about accessibility. We knew nothing about it, but like any good developer, we took the job. Um, and then that preceded uh, our research phase. Our research phase started after that. And part of that was we came across the National Federation of the Blind. It's actually the largest um, gathering of blind people in the world, really, convention. So that, that was a big deal. That was in Orlando. So that was only about an hour drive. So it was right in our backyard. And going through that was when we realized how, how many disabled individuals there were. We really never really thought about it um, and how difficult it was for them to, to navigate technology and stuff. It was a big deal. And once we got out of that, we, we continued our research phase and just found it very difficult to find any information about accessibility. It, it, was, uh, it was pretty hard. That's when we decided we need to put it all together and get the word out. So that's how this talk came about. Web accessibility made easy for WordPress. Okay, in this talk, I'm going to give you guys some facts and I'm going to explain what Section 508 is. I'm going to offer you our 11 easy steps for, to help you with your Section 508 compliance. And at the end, I'm going to give you some free developer tools that will help you. All right, a few facts. Over 1 billion people worldwide have some sort of disability. That's a big number. And of that, an estimated 253 million people have a vision impairment. And that's kind of what we focus on when it comes to accessibility because we think that's the, the group that has the biggest hurdles for internet. They all have hurdles, but we believe we can reach and help the most people with that group. Um, and of that 253 million, 19 million of those vision impaired people are children. And I have two kids watching them interact with technology. Um, they're just pretty much one and the same at this point. They're like little cyborgs. And I can just only imagine 19 million. All right. There were 814 Section 508 lawsuits in 2017. There was over 2,200 lawsuits last year. All 2,200 lawsuits were filed by less than 50 plaintiffs. And the little kind of catch-22 here is, is I'm going to show you how to be Section 508 compliant, and that's the law. But the lawsuits are happening under Title III of the ADA, not Section 508, which is Title III states that an individual has got to have the same access to everything that everybody does. That's where uh, like blue parking spaces and bathrooms, large bathrooms, th things like that came about. This is just basically Title III for the internet. This little graph right here, you can, you can see the exponential growth in lawsuits. 2015, there was 57. 2016, there was 262. 2017, 814. Last year, 2200. And you can imagine what 2019 is going to be. See, I'm going to have to redo my graph here. <clears throat> and most of the lawsuits are coming from New York and Florida. New, out of the 2,200, I think New York had 1,500. I think Florida had five or 600. And basically, the rest of America split the last 100 or two. <coughs> All right. What is Section 508 and WCAG? WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, is basically the worldwide criteria that they put together for websites. Um, they break it down into three different levels, A, AA, and AAA. Basically, Section 508 says you have to be A and AA compliant of WCAG. AAA compliant is very difficult, if not impossible, in some, some scenarios to obtain. Okay, Section 508, this is the one we're worried about. This is uh, pretty much a dumbed down version of WCAG. This is the American version. Again, WCAG is three levels, A, AA, AAA. Section 508, the American version says that we have to be compliant to 
level A and double A of WCAG. <clears throat> and uh, the Section 508 is just a part of the America's Disability Act. All right, well, WCAG breaks down into four main ideas. We got perceivable, deals with things like text alternative, media, um, make sure things are distinguishable. Then you got operable. You gotta make sure your entire site's accessible by only a keyboard. You gotta make sure you got enough time. You gotta think of things like seizures and uh, make sure your site's navigable. Understandable, you gotta make sure your site's readable. You gotta make sure it's predictable and you gotta make sure um, assistive technologies and stuff work and understand your site. Robust, make sure it's compatible with different pieces of assistive technology and into the future. Don't just think of now, think of where this technology is gonna be a few years down the road so your site works. Okay, why does section 508 exist? This is why. Because this is what 253 million people see when they go to your website. They don't see nothing. We can fight all day long with the client. You know, the client wants us to make this special font. They want all these amazing colors and all these things. <clears throat> it's all irrelevant to an individual who's disabled and especially the 253 million people who are, who are low vision because this is what they see. All right, now with that, I'm gonna offer our 11 easy steps and we're gonna go through them here one by one. All right, number one, we got provide alternative text for non-text content. This is probably one of the easiest things, and this is the most common thing that everybody, everybody knows about. <clears throat> all right, when you add a picture to your media library in the back end, I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with this, you're gonna have a place right here to add your alt text. Um, and you just want a nice descriptive text. They say no more than 200, I try to be less than about 100. About a good sentence or two, good descriptive sentence. Um, Can I help you with SEO anyway? I have not seen any data that, that this helps you SEO with the alt text. We typically do like the description and title is what we do when we do SEO and stuff like that. Um, this is just a closer up of this. It's a picture of a device that allows you to see with your tongue and that's actually a real device and I, that was from the NFB. That was pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> with the, the Gutenberg update, they add this down here. This allows you to click an image and tell the screen reader basically that it's decorative and that tells the screen reader to just skip right over it. So you either have to have an alt tag or you have to mark it as decorative. One of those two things has to happen for you to be compliant. What websites would this apply for? If I just did a crazy one, music or something like that, would I have to worry about all this stuff? If it has a picture on your website, it has to have either an alt tag or, or labeled decorative, no matter what. Do I have to worry about the whole 508 thing? Um, <clears throat> the, well, this is where the gray area is. I mean, it's not law for the average individual, but it's law for government and it's law for anybody who's doing business with, with government, anybody doing contract work at all. But if you look at the 2200 lawsuits that I put up there, none of those are Section 508 lawsuits. Those are all Title III lawsuits. So, to answer your question, if you have a little mom and pop website, you probably aren't gonna have to worry too much about it because there's so many other big fish in, in the sea to fry. But the fact is, if your site is not, if, if there's an area of your site that cannot be reached by an individual using a piece of technology or is blind, you can, can be sued. It doesn't matter whether you're government doing business with the government because again, those lawsuits are not under Section 508, they're under Title III. And Title III says that an individual does not have full access to your website. The same as any brick and mortar. And that's what's happening. They're taking all those brick and mortar laws and just moving them right over to the, the web. So. so I guess there's a site where I can go and read Title III and all this stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, you can go to the government, you, you can look up the law for... Is, is what you're saying, is this going to be on a place somewhere where I can look at it on the web? You're, you're, you're yes, I mean, I have it on our site, we've got it on YouTube, I'm sure WordCamp uh, Atlanta is going to ask me for it and they'll post it wherever they post it, uh, this whole presentation. So you'll be able to look at all of this, absolutely. All right, number two, label form elements. I'm sure we all got input um, values and stuff like that on our website. <clears throat> especially a contact form. This is very simple. Th these are your form elements, last name, first name, very simple. Um, 
Contact Form 7 is a very popular one. They come, their form elements already come labeled. Unless you're adding new ones, then you're going to have to manually add them. But Contact Form 7 works real well. Um, Gravity Form works too well, too. And I believe they have some plugins that help with their accessibility. Okay, number three, add manuscript or closed captions for videos and add audio description for animations. You're talking about a, a music site. I don't know if you actually have a music site, but this this will kind of pertain to that. This is uh, add manuscript or closed captions. If yeah, <laughs> all right. An example of closed caption. YouTube. How many people here use YouTube to upload videos to their to their sites and stuff? All right, well, we do. We do all the time, and it's very easy. You upload a video, you can SEO it up, they give you a little short code, put it in the back end, and it displays the video. What well, YouTube, what most people don't realize, and I didn't realize until I got into the whole accessibility thing, is, is YouTube, the blind community, uses YouTube to get a large portion of their information because um, the way they make, they make it so easy. So what you do is when you upload a video, you can go into edit and you go to subtitles forward slash CC, take you to a little, a little window and it'll allow you to add closed captions. You can do it in multiple different ways. Uh, YouTube will do it for you. You can add it manually or upload a draft or you can open it on the front end and let anybody who's watching manually chime in and then you can okay it. Um, and then what that does, that opens up down here the little CC button. So if someone comes to, to uh, you know, this video, they just click that and automatically have it. And YouTube's really, really good with that. They do it automatically. I think if your video is more than 15, 20 minutes long, it might take an hour or two, up to 24 hours for them to manually do your uh, closed caption, but they will do it. It's pretty awesome. I have seen that they do that. Is there any way that I could go in and edit it where they spelled something wrong or, or misinterpreted it? When they do the automatic, I've not been able to edit their automatic, but in the same area, you can manually do it. Um, so, you know, yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> How accurate are they? Because I, I teach online, and mm -hmm. so we have closed captioning on the videos mm -hmm. program that we use, and Kaltura sucks. Right, so, right. Um, um, I don't, I don't, I've never compared this to other ones, but they tend to be pretty good. I mean, there are going to be mistakes, like everything else, but they, they tend to be pretty well, okay. pretty good. So, is it part of the YouTube thing that, that you generated? Because it takes a little while. It'll take a little while for it to kick in if your video is more than, like I said, 10, 15, 20 minutes. It could take an hour or two. It could take 24 hours. Well, I mean, like when you're watching it. Well, I, don't, I don't understand the question. Oh, sometimes they'll say, like, if there's not closed captions mm -hmm. already available, mm -hmm. um, if I'll click, like, auto generate, sometimes, like, I want to watch it in time. And I don't want to wake up my husband. Right. But there's almost never. Right, okay, so um, unless the individual uploading the video does that, there's nothing you can do. There's no, the, uh, YouTube doesn't automatically do that. Okay. The, the person uploading the video, like when I upload a video, I go in to my edit video and then tell YouTube to automatically do that. So unless that individual did that, then there's no CCs for you to click on. Okay, but you can also, while you're uploading it, go through it and type in the caption. Yes, if you want to, yes, um, absolutely. When you go to subtitles forward slash CC, and in, uh, it'll ask you to add, if you want to add subtitles, and then it'll give you those options. You can automatically do it, manually do it, or release it on the, open on the front end and let people chime in and do it. So it, it, it's pretty cool. All right, an example of audio description. This is very rarely done, but it's just as important. This right here, I just took this snippet, um, this video, The Lion King, I'm sure everybody's familiar with The Lion King. Well, the opening scenes, this, this lady on the YouTube used about two minutes, you see, two minutes, 23, sec 23 seconds. She used this to just show how to add audio description. And what this is, is um, you can use this, this, little, this little short code here, and it'll take you to this two minute clip. But the opening scene is just a bunch of music. You got a bunch of animals going up to Pride Rock, and then they hold the little lion up in the air and all that stuff. But there's no, there's no words through this two minutes. So what happens is this lady talks 
while this has happened, she, she describes, just like what I did, a bunch of animals going up the, the green grassy knoll to Pride Rock, and then the bird swoops in, and the lion holds the, the little lion up in the air. She's just describing the scene, if there's no words, and that's, that's very important as well. All right, ensure color contrast meets minimum thresholds. It's another very easy one. Color contrast should be a minimum of four and a half to one. With the exception of links and text, they can be three to one. My personal opinion, I just wish they would have said everything needs to be four and a half to one, would have made it easier. But they give you a little leeway. All right, this is an example of bad contrast. I mean, it just speaks for itself. This, it's terrible. That's an example of good contrast. You can just absolutely see the difference. Just, you know, just a couple of color choices. You're making a big difference for somebody. All right, number five, make all link text descriptive. Now a little side note, between this and alternative text, I can go to almost every site and fail somebody because I can almost always find a picture without a text, without an alternative text, and I can find a, a link that says click here or something like that. So you do that kind of thing for a living? Yes. Yeah, we run audits, and then we'll come back if they want us to remediate. We, after we run the audit, we, teach, we tell them exactly where their problems are, show their IT team how to fix it. If it's beyond their capacity, they'll just hand it back to us and tell us to remediate it, but it's kind of like a two-phase process. Um, okay, for, an exam for a bad example of link description, click here or read more. Like I said, almost I have done this so many times until I realized how bad it was. So I'm not laying judgment on everybody. Um, for an example of a good link description, follow this link to Wikipedia. The reason why this is is because an individual using a screen reader, typically the screen reader will skip content and it'll just hit headers and it'll just hit links. So when it hits these links, it'll say link, click here, or link, read more. It won't, it would not have talked about the, uh, like the context, the context clues and stuff. So you won't know what you're reading more on. You won't know where you're, where you're clicking going. So when it gets down here on the proper one, it'll say uh, link Wikipedia. So now that individual knows when they click that link, they're going to Wikipedia, not some random cyberspace place. All right. <clears throat> Number six, the color of any given content cannot be the only indication of meaning. This, has, this basically has to do with like um, colorblind individuals. I think it's 8% or 9% of men eventually become colorblind, 1% or 2% of women eventually become colorblind. So no matter what we talk about disability, 1 out of 10 adults is going to have this issue eventually. Um, okay, here, using color to convey meaning for input fields. Incorrect example. This is how the screen reader is going to read it. Required fields are in red, name and email. Now if you closed your eyes, you wouldn't know which one is required out of that. Required fields are in red, name and email. I wouldn't know. So what you got to do is you come over here, required fields are in red and marked with an asterisk, name, email, asterisk. And that's how the screen reader is going to read it. So now I know email, the one with the asterisk, is the required field. Very, very simple stuff. All right, we got down here a little problem here. Here's the incorrect example. Which is the right angle triangle, green, blue, red, yellow, don't know. If I'm colorblind, I don't know that these, which triangle correlates with the proper answer. So to fix that, well, all you're gonna do is you're gonna add some numbers in here and make sure that they match. You know, green is one, blue is two. So now when I'm reading this math problem or this uh, geometry problem, I know which triangle correlates to this and I'm able to now get the correct answer. Without those numbers, I wouldn't know if I was colorblind. All right, make your font size at least 16. Easiest thing you can possibly do is, I know it's a little big, but it is the way it is. I think the actual rule is 15 to 16. It depends on whether or not some, you know, on what font type you're using, some's bigger than others, whether it's bold, stuff like that. But the, the general rule of thumb, make sure it's at least 16 and you're good to go. All right, your error handling. If there's an input error by the user, it must be identified and described in the text explaining the error to the user. 
much easier than it sounds. Basically, you go to a contact form. Whoops, I forgot to add the title. We can see with an asterisk it's, it's uh, mandatory. Oops, I forgot to add my last name. You hit enter. This is how your form should speak to the individual. I added these red boxes, so you don't need that. But this is how it says, please review your errors below. Title is required. Last name is required. That tells them where they went wrong. And they're able to sift through that and add the proper information. All right, tab navigation. Your entire website should be able to be navigated by using only your keyboard and do not ignore the focus state. Focus state is, okay, let's assume you're going to a website. You just go to a website. When you hit the tab button, generally the first thing that's gonna pop up is you'll see a little box pop up. That's focus state. It tells you what your focus, tells the individual what they're focused on because if you keep hitting your tab button, it's called tab navigation, it should flow like in this order down a predictable order down your website. And every time your tab lands on something, you gotta know that that's where your tab is. So um, generally a little box goes around it and just let you know that that's what you're focused on. So if you hit enter, you're, you're clicking that. Otherwise you won't know where your tab is. Um, Can I ask you a question? If you have two or three columns side by side, uh, I was watching, I was at the ladies yesterday that did a little bit of this. The screen reader was going all the way straight across, even from jumping from column to column. So is the focus state going to make it stay on one column before it goes to the next? No, focus state only, the only thing the focus state does is tell you where it is. It just, it's a, it's a visual landmark of telling you, okay, this is where my tab is. There surely must be, it surely must be, I must be wrong. If you have two columns side by side, how are you going to keep the screen reader from going from this column, jump to that column and going down? It must certainly do one column at a time. Um, no, I mean, it depends. I mean, you can have it set up, but generally they go from left to right, go down, left to right, all the way across, kind of like a typewriter. Generally, that's how they go. So many you, news sites are bunches of columns. Right. You can have it set up, screen reader set up certain ways. Like most people have it set up to where it just goes through your links and your headers. So what they'll do is they'll go through their H1 headers and it'll read the H1 header. If they want to read more content about that, they'll hit enter or something, then it'll hit the body. Okay. Otherwise, it's just, it's just kind of skipping through the site. Okay. You, you know that and if you listen to if you ever if you go to YouTube I highly recommend going to YouTube and and searching for somebody using a screen reader the way they use it is amazing it's like an auctioneer the speed that they have this thing on and the way they they navigate the site it's amazing first time I've ever seen that it's amazing it's really mind blowing yes and at the end I give you some uh, some free screen readers to check out and stuff all right, <clears throat> you must offer flexible time limits, if any, associated with the website or software. Now I kind of talk out of both sides of my mouth on this one because here I am at the Accessibility Talk telling you not to give them time limits. But when we give our WordPress security talk, we tell you give them time limits and log out idle users. So I think there's a happy in between. You definitely need to log out idle users, especially when you're dealing with credit cards and banks and things like that, any type of financial stuff or pertinent information. So what you want to do is when, you're, when your time limits come and do, you want to maybe have a big button pop up and say, you're about to run out of time. Click this button to gain an extra minute, five minutes, 20 minutes, whatever you want. But make it very easy for that individual to gain more time because it's super important. For security, they kind of have to be logged out. But you can imagine you're struggling, already struggling to, to navigate this website. And you're five, 10 minutes into it and you get logged out and you got to start all over again. That's, uh, you know, I don't think that's going to get you sued, but it's, it's not about being sued. It's, it's about helping the end user. So, all right. Number 11, provide skip nav links so that the user can skip repetitive content such as nav menus and widgets. Now this touches a little bit what you're talking about, how you can make it skip and skip around. You add skip nav links. This is a, this is a huge deal too, because um, like I explained, if an average person or a, a, a disabled or blind individual goes to a website, first thing they do is they hit, first thing they do is hit tab, boom. This, uh, this something will light up right here, typically saying this is where you are. Now what you want to do is you want to, the very first time someone hits tab, you want to, you want that to go to a skip link, which is what we're talking about here. And what that skip link does is it skips all the repetitive content. We all 
have big, beautiful drop-down menus that we build because we want you to go to every single page on our site, and, and we all love our drop-down menus. But the problem with those is that when a, um, a low-vision individual goes to every single page, they got to navigate that huge that huge drop-down menu and all these other bells and whistles you got before the content, they got to navigate it on every single page. So if they want to go to another page on your site, they, they've got to go through all that processes unless you add a skip nav link. Again, when they hit tab, it'll say skip the content or something. And they can click that and skip the, skip the drop-down menu and go straight to the content. That's a big deal. That's, that's a major, major help. All right, now this came straight from WordPress. This is an example from WordPress. Um, this, this just gives how you do some, some skip links in the back end and stuff um, inside the landmark for consistency, inside the header landmark, and it'll skip down here to these kinds of things. Um, or you can just go download this plugin, which we have no affiliation with this plugin. No, don't make no, no money. I mean, this plugin's free anyways, but we've got no affiliation with this plugin. It's just a good plugin. Um, and the, once you download it and activate it, the very first thing on it is enable skip link. So you just click that. Pretty much, I've not seen a newer theme that does not come with skip links already, but we've all got those clients um, that just don't want to change, that have old themes, don't want to pay us to upgrade and all that stuff. So if, so if you run across those situations, there's workarounds. You can very easily add this plugin or go, go in the back, and, in the back and, and add this this here for you. So, so there are options. All right. <clears throat> that is pretty much our 11 easy steps. Um, if you want, this is, this is good picture taking material right here. You take a picture of this and this, you know, if you're able, I do want to say a quick thing about this though. Um, if you follow every single one of these 11 steps to the T and do everything Joe said to do, you're still not compliant. You're still not, we can be here for hours and hours talking about compliance. The purpose of this is we started as developers designing and building sites and software. If we would have known how easy it was to make our sites compliant and inclusive and accessible, we would have been, we add this to our process of building sites now. We would have been doing this from the beginning if we would have realized how easy it was and how big of a difference this makes. So. You're not protected from lawsuits. You're still not fully compliant. But if we all do this right here, we will make a difference. Okay, here's some free tools for you. Userway.org. If I could get you to do anything when you get home, it is add this plug into your site. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you another favor, but this is one of them. If you go to our website, stpetedesign.com, S-T-P-E-T-E design.com, you'll see this plugin in action. Again, this is another one. This has nothing to do with us. This is not our plugin. We don't make nothing off this plugin. It's just a fantastic, easy plugin. What this does is adds a little icon. Ours is right here. So when you go to our site, an individual can click that and a menu pops up and it allows them to do things like um, increase text size by 200%. Um, add contrast, fix the contrast ratio on everything, um, set it up to where your site's nothing but basically links. It gives them lots of options. So if you're not going to do something yourself, just add that and at least gives them the options to do things. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> the next couple of tools are, are um, what we use part of our toolbox for running audits. We got Wave, WebAIM, very easy site. Um, you can either add it as a Chrome extension or just go to their site and then copy paste your URL and put it in there and they'll do a quick um, automatic audit of your site and show you errors and stuff wh where you're having issues. Google Lighthouse does the same thing. It's in your Chrome, it's in your, um, Chrome browser. It's very easy to do. It runs an automatic test, gives you a score between one and a hundred, tells you where it is you suck but it also gives you a list of 12 manual steps to check your sites that automated tests cannot check, which is very useful. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
And then I'm going to skip down here because you got access. This is another testing tool. This is another great testing tool for Chrome, you know, as an extension. Um, this, this, this one is one of my personal favorites just because it's more conservative than the other ones and it gives you less false positives. Every single um, testing tool there is will give you false positives, false negatives. That's just the way it is. You, that's why we use, we use about five different pieces of automated testing software when we test our, our sites and then we go through and do all of our manual testing. And that's, just, I mean, we've tried paid plugins, paid software. There, there seems to be nothing out there that, that, that doesn't do that. The is the ax for Chrome, yes. Um, another one, I thought I had it up here. I don't have it up here. Um, Wally, -E, W-A-1-1-Y, -one -one oh, that's right. Um, it's here, but it's in, okay, well this one here, WordPress Accessibility Tools and Alt Text Finder, this is our plugin. This is completely free, not freemium, but completely free, always will be free. So this is not why I'm here today. So this, this plugin is my personal favorite. I mean, we all think our baby's the prettiest, but um, this finds all your missing alt tags. This is a big deal because alt tags are, are, are easy to, to fix, easy to do as you're going, but if you gotta go back and remediate, it's tough because you gotta go through and fix every photo in your media library and then you gotta go find that photo on the front end and fix it because it does not translate. If you add alt text in the media library, it does not push it to the front end. So you're doing that work two, maybe even three times if you got that picture in a couple different locations. What this does is this on the back end brings all of your pictures together and then you can, and you can click a button that says missing alt tag and it'll send all your pictures to the top. That's missing alt tags, so you can add the alt and then it also grab all the pictures from your front end and you can add them there too. So it's, it makes it so much easier. It, fixing alt tags is very easy, but it's very time consuming, very time consuming. Okay, we also give you a contrast ratio on the back end, allows you to check your contrast ratios. You can add your foreground, background, tells you what your ratio is, whether you pass, fail. It also gives you an example. Um, and then we also added a WCAG 2.1 checklist. If you go to W3C, which I'll give you on the next slide, the actual WCAG guidelines back there are all in government speak, all the blue and white, it's a pain in the butt. What we did is we went through and we tried to, we tried to turn it into English, make it understandable to, to dummies like me. Um, and then we also add this Wally testing software, which I was, which I was uh, talking about. This is, this is a lot like Axe. It does a lot of the same stuff. Axe is a little bit better because it gives you less false positives, but this Wally is very good as well. And again, it's in our plugin, so you just turn that on and then you go to the front end of your site while you're logged in and uh, it'll give you a little icon down here. A box will pop up and it'll let you check your headers, contrast ratios, links, all that, descriptions. Um, it's very, very useful. Cool thing about the Wally is, is if you're looking at headers or contrast ratio, whatever you're looking at, another box pops up. Um, okay, well, let's say that this is this is what has an issue. We'll just say this has a contrast issue. Um, what happened is a little little icon will pop up saying this is your problem, and then or that's where your problem is. And then another box will pop up showing what your problem is. It talks about your contrast ratio, and then the cool thing it'll suggest colors for you, say uh, like our site is blue and green and, and our green is right on the line. So it'll suggest a darker green to bring you to 4.51, just over the threshold of compliance. But that's pretty cool. It it'll give you a code snippet of where it's wrong and stuff. So that's, that's pretty awesome. And then we also give you some great resources. A lot of stuff there. All right. <clears throat> These are the screen readers I was talking about. NVDA was actually created by blind developers for, screen, for uh, this screen reader. And I can't think of anybody better to develop a screen reader than a blind developer. And it's free. So, um, you know, it's, and then we got Chromevox. Chromevox is easier to download because it's obviously in Chrome browser. It's just an extension, very easy to download. But NVDA is the better of the two by far of screen readers. And a little uh, piece of advice, know where the off button is before you turn the on button on, <laughs> on these things, because it, it's frustrating when you can't find the off button and your computer's yelling at you constantly. <laughs> I feel like it's just yelling dummy to me, dummy, dummy, I can't find anything. All right, here's some resources for you. I just made some short codes just to, just to save space. 
Um, these are the actual WCAG 2.1 guidelines. You go to the W3C and that's the actual real deal guidelines. And I remember for Section 508, you only need to be level A and double A compliant. <clears throat> DOJ withdrawing their recommendations a few years ago. They were supposed to have the law put out, I believe, in January, February of last year, but the DOJ withdraw, withdrew their recommendations. Here's a list of lawsuits for the first two months of 2018. It's only the first few months, but it's hundreds of lawsuits. And it's cool because this article will allow you to click the lawsuit and then you go to the actual lawsuit and you can read all about it. Um, it's amazing. I mean, Huge websites, Amazon, Nike, Rolex, Ticketmaster. You would think these guys would be compliant, but they're, I mean, they're billion dollar companies, but they, they weren't compliant. Um, we got an article here about the 2200 lawsuits, just a pretty neat little article. Then we got a comparison table of Section 508. They just came out with the new four point, or I'm sorry, 2.1 guidelines. I believe it was probably six months ago, eight months ago. Um, and this comparison table shows you what's different between WCAG 2.0 and WCAG 2.1. Um, a, a couple of small differences, but, but they're important because there are some things that weren't handled in 2.0, things like logos and text on pictures and things like that, that there was some gray area and they've addressed those. WordPress accessibility info. This is straight from the WordPress's site. They actually give you pretty good info. Who'd have thunk it? You know, you go to their site and you can actually learn about accessibility. I've pulled a few snippets out of this talk from, from there. <clears throat> and this right here, this is the actual law that's in place. This came into place, I think, December 21st of last year. So it's been about five months or so. This is, the, this is the real deal law. And this is for government agencies and anybody who does business with the government agencies, anybody who contracts with them. They actually, because we've, we, we've actually done a couple of sites for people who contract for the government, just for them to even bid, they have to fill out a piece of paper saying and signing off that they are Section 508 compliant, their website is compliant. If their website is not compliant, they can't even put in a bid. So it, it's, they say it's the law for government agencies, but it's government agencies and anybody doing business. This is an accessibility statement creator. This is from the W3C themselves. You can't get any more real deal than that. This is very important. This is the, uh, this is the other thing I, I, I ask you guys to do, to put an accessibility statement in your footer. What this does is, is you go to W3C and they just ask you a bunch of questions and you just fill out a form. It takes about 20 minutes. Um, it asks you, you know, um, what your site is, what you've done to test your site, what areas you're not compliant or having issues with, what you're doing to fix them, how, how an individual can contact you if they're having a problem with, with their website. And you got to remember, this is very big, giving people an outlet. You know, if, if, if an individual goes to your site and can't, and can't navigate and have issues, it's going to make them real mad. Well, we all know from customer service, you give, if you give a customer or an individual an outlet to communicate their issues, you can solve a lot of problems immediately. So if you give them that outlet to where they're having a problem with your site, instead of getting on a lawyer and suing or, or however they want to handle it, if they have an option to call you up and let you know, hey, I'm having a problem with this area of your website, and you respond and say, thank you so much, we know that's a problem and we're working on it. You can, you can alleviate, you can diffuse a lot of situations just like that. And if lawyers, anybody out there, you know, it's happening. And this, this talk is not about, not about lawsuit prevention. It's about helping the end user, and it really is. But the fact of the matter is when you're dealing with clients, you got to talk to them like that. You got to let them know that it's... Because every time I tell a client about accessibility, they look at me like I'm just trying to get more money out of them, like I'm just trying to work them. But you know, the fact is, is, is it's mandatory and it's making a difference. Lawsuits are happening. So my point being, if you've got an accessibility statement in your footer and you've got that little icon from UserWay on the front of your site, you're better than most people out there. And just like a sticker, ADT sticker on your window, if a burglar's coming to your house and sees that, he's just gonna go to the house next door that doesn't have a sticker because it's just easier. The lawyers and individuals are gonna do the same thing. If you are, if you are proactive in your accessibility, more than likely they're gonna skip over you and go to the next guy who's done nothing.
All right, we got any questions? That's that was pretty much about it. We got any questions on accessibility or anything? Are you based out of Atlanta here? No, St. Pete. But we do. I mean, we do worldwide. We're dealing with. We also deal with GDPR over with Europe and stuff. So these things kind of are similar. They're there. It is law for them. Yeah. It is law for everybody. It, it has to be that way now. So yes, yeah. It's 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 hardcore over there. I, they have not asked me to provide them yet. I will. They're on, if you go to our website under talks, we've got, I've got this talk and I've actually got our slides up there, but it's St. S-T-P-E-T-E -E design, St. Pete design.com. And then you go up to talks and we've got a bunch of talks and the first couple of talks is this actual presentation. Um, and then I also have a video up there of just the slides. I just went through PowerPoint, just made a slide video. So you, you don't gotta, yes, you don't gotta listen to my annoying voice the whole time. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm brand new and I understand this is above my head. Um, I'm a beginner. Would I need this for anything? Yes. Yeah, the, the question, so the question is, you're a beginner, is this useful for you? I'm going to say absolutely yes, because the, the 11 steps I offer is meant to just add to your process of designing and building your website. If you're doing these things as you go, you will not, excuse me, you will not feel, feel it. You'll, you'll have minimal time added to your project. I mean, it really is, you just don't feel it and as you go, and then we're really helping people. So inter, uh, WordPress run, runs over a third of the internet. I mean, I think the second largest CMS is like 7%, 8%, something like some ridiculous number. So we're the ones, if anybody, if anybody in the internet world is gonna make a difference, it's, it's people in this room, no matter what your experience level. We can, I, I wish I had known this and started from the beginning. Um, but it is what it is. Now, another thing too, in California, the, for a couple months ago, the first time, a developer got sued for not building a website accessible. So we, so we all know California, that's where things first start to happen. And then they work their way out into the real world. Um, so that's coming. <laughs> um, so that's coming. So be careful with that. And I've talked to, I just came back from LA actually last weekend giving a talk at WordCamp. And I met a couple of developers there. And what they're doing is they're going back to all their previous clients and telling them either, you got two options, either make your site accessible or sign this release form saying that I'm not liable for your website. And 100% of the clients say, okay, make my site accessible. So they're ginning up a lot of business this way. Um, I don't know, we got any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious, do you have any idea why so many lawsuits are in New York and Florida? I do not. I can understand why New, why New York, my, my thinking was, I would think New York and California would be the two biggest, right? Well, California, I think, says had 40 last year. Well, going to LA and talking to developers there, what apparently is happening was, um, there, was a, there was a lawsuit and a judge handed down a judgment that made it not advantageous for them to bring lawsuits up through the federal. So they all started suing through the state, state level instead of federal. So my stat is just federal, 2,200 lawsuits federal nationwide. Well, apparently there was about two or 3,000 law, are we close? Oh yeah, we better wrap things. Okay. Okay, most, most of the lawsuits are through the state. So two, 3,000 lawsuits from California are happening. You had a question? Mm -hmm. Having the headers right yes. the screen Huge. will skip to certain yes. things. So I just wanted to kind of get your take. Is that still the case? Absolutely. When you run these tests, uh, the tests I show you, the, one of the first things that pop up are your header levels. They got to be in order. When you, and it has to do with uh, in logical order. The question was about headers. Are they important? Yes. Header H1, H2, H2 they got to be in order. You can't skip them. It, it, uh, you typically start with an H1 and then you go H2, H3, H4. You come, you know, come down here. They like you to do an H2. H3, H4, H2, H3, H4, but uh, you don't want to skip. You don't want to go from H1 to H3, H2 to H4. The reason why that is because if they're navigating, tab navigating, it's going to send you all over the place. And you will, And the law you're breaking is you're not in a predictable order anymore. And that is actually against the law. I don't think I ever used headers. <laughs> I caught you. I 
<laughs> right? No, it's it's hugely important. Absolutely. So I appreciate you guys coming out. Thank you so much. Thank you. You got any questions?